wanted to ask you a question about the tests. I know we need more available, and that is important for the people that need them, but is there not a slight fear, because it is, uh, I am a little nervous about this, that people will flock to these sites to get tested when treatment would be the same whether you have it and know it or, or don't have it. So is there any fear that we could overwhelm that and expose more people by flocking to get tested? So in a lot of places, what we're starting to figure out is that uh, we should do drive-by testing. Uh, uh, this may not work in New York City, but it'll work in a lot of parts of the country. Everybody stays in their car. Someone who's fully outfitted swabs the nose. Uh, they exchange information so that they can call back in or get a text that tells them whether or not they have it. So that the testing itself is not putting people in a position where one person is transferring it to another person to another person. So your point's a good point, but it means we need to find a way to do it that doesn't run that risk. But it is important for people to get tested because people with coronavirus need to take very special precautions to eliminate giving it to other people. If you've just got the ordinary flu, sure, you should take precautions. We don't want anyone to be sick. But it's not the same as someone who has coronavirus. And public health officials need to be able to know how many people are out there who have it, where are they, what ages are they, because that's how they get more information and track the disease. And that helps us deal with the crisis much more effectively. So don't, don't push the idea that we don't want to test. We just want to do it in the safest possible way. S Senator, this is Sunny. Uh Getting back to the economics of this, sure. in, in reading um, on the bill, I'm hearing a lot about bailing out the airline industry, bailing out the cruise ship industry. And my concern is, why are we bailing out those industries and not necessarily thinking about the small businesses, the mom and pop shops, those businesses that are employing people that are living paycheck to paycheck? We know that 59% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. Isn't that a huge concern uh, about making sure that our country is just up and running, the, the heart of our country? So you're asking exactly the right question, Sonny. It's not only what kind, how big a stimulus do we need, but where exactly should it be directed? And what kind of strings should be associated with it? So I'm with you. A big part of this should be going to small businesses that are going to need help to make it through this crisis. Uh, look what's happened to the restaurant industry, for example. They're just basically shut down. And many of them have no income coming in or only what they can do on takeout. And think what that means for all the people who ordinarily, uh, the, the waiters and waitresses, the, the people who cook, the people who clean up, they're just all out of work at this point. So making sure that the stimulus money is going to them and the support is going to them, I think should be a first priority. But I also understand about how hard the airline industry has been hit, the cruise industry. The way I see this is if these big corporations want to come to the taxpayer and ask for help, then there have to be some strings attached to it. We can't have a repeat of 2008 where basically we shoved the money out the door to the big banks and boy, the big banks got profitable in a hurry, but they also um, didn't help the people who really needed help, the homeowners uh, keeping their employees. So we need to make sure that any taxpayer assistance that goes to any of these corporations, these big corporations, come with real strings attached on making sure the money is truly going to the workforce making sure it's going down to the grassroots level and not to uh, corporate executives' bonuses and to bigger payouts to stockholders. Senator Warren, this is Sarah again, and we can't let you go without asking the next question. So a few weeks ago when you dropped out, you were the last woman standing, and so many of us are ready for a female president, and we know it will happen. But it was disheartening, and then we were somewhat encouraged when Biden said he would be picking a female vice president. Have you had any conversations with him? Because it may be smart to bring on the progressives, to bring some of that vote with his candidacy. Um, you can feel free to break that news here. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, Sarah. I'm glad you raised this. You know, I'll just say to you, because you'll appreciate this. 
One of the hardest parts about suspending the campaign was all the little girls I'd done pinky promises mm -hmm. with uh, that we talked about. Um, my name is Elizabeth. I'm running for president because that's what girls do. Mm -hmm. And we did pinky promises to remember, and that, that made it really hard uh, to have to end the campaign. But I really was heartened to hear the vice president say that he thinks it is time to get a woman at least somewhere close to the White House <laughs> uh, as vice president. Um, and, and I thought it showed on his part that he understands that we are a changing electorate and we are changing what we see as leadership in this country and that we need to take a broader embrace. And so I was glad to see it. Would I was glad to hear Bernie say and, and I that hate he to would cut, certainly think And I hate this. to cut you off, but would you take the job? <laughs> uh, it, it, no one has asked, uh, okay. and it would be presumptuous for me to talk about <laughs> it. So. Well, thank, well you. thank you, and we are just so happy that uh, you're still in the Senate and, and fighting the fight.